Hello, everybody. Welcome to this week's edition of the Media Boat Podcast. In case you don't have a calendar, today is November 25th, 2020, the day before Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving Eve, if you will. Turkey Day Eve, if you will not. Um, if you don't know what a Media Boat Podcast is, I'm not sure what you're doing. Are you lifting? No, um, I'm roof? looking for the, the headroom that I have here. Oh, headroom. Because it was like headroom. pointing at the ceiling. Of course, yes. this is um, if you're looking at the YouTube video, <laughs> yes. a great bit. Otherwise, oh, this doesn't play yeah. on radio. In Otherwise, it doesn't form. work at all, which is kind of why I pointed it out. This is the Media Boat Podcast. We're a podcast about movies, television, music, and video games. Actually, in that order, I did it again. Um, I'm thankful you did that in the right order. <laughs> very thankful. Uh, this is episode 255. My yep. name is Matt. With me is Mike. I'm Mike. He's Matt. This is pre-Thanksgiving, or I guess it's Thanksgiving Eve. Yeah. Episode number 255. Yeah. Um, what are we thankful for? But our wonderful listener. <laughs> yes. Singular. Yes. <laughs> I hope you catch that. <laughs> I, 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 you know, we actually don't know how many people listen to this show. We do get downloads. We do get um, there's some metrics we yeah, see. Yeah, some analytics that we can look at. Uh, but we don't know until we hear from you, the listener. So if you do listen to the show, feel free to leave a comment on the YouTube page. Leave a comment on our like reply to our Twitter posts. Now that we're reinstated after a brief hiatus on Twitter. Uh, yes, Twitter thought we were a bot because we were spamming our episodes. <laughs> see, that's the thing. If you we had audience interaction, Twitter wouldn't think we're a robot. So hey, well, I interact with my own robot. So <laughs> sure, yes. Um, so yeah, uh, thank you for joining us. We have quite a show for you today. It's award season, so we got plenty to talk about with awards. However, what we're not awards for quite yet is movies. And we always start the show with movies. Skipping the box office, really dismal week. 1.2 uh, million. Is... One new release, though. Today, DreamWorks uh, The Crude's A New Age is out. So if you want to venture to a drive-in to see that, that is an option for you this weekend. Yes, lucky you. Lucky you. If, you, if you're wanting to escape your family. <laughs> and go to a prehistoric family yes uh that is not the flintstones the crudes are there for you also here you for could say it's a crude adaptation mm -hmm. i feel like we should have done those jokes in the first one seems like a waste for the sequel yes, but see the we weren't <laughs> around for the first one that's true that's how long the sequel has been it's how long it's been a, how long the wait has been for crudes too um I certainly have not been waiting for it. I don't think I have never even seen the Crudes one. I don't know anything about it. I believe it was 2013. Sounds about right. The Crudes. But what we can give you and what we do care about deeply is movie news. And we start the movie news this week with a couple of Media Boat podcast favorites, Phil Lord and Chris Miller. Yes, Lord Miller, uh, our favorites here for their writing and their directing and their overall comedic humor. What's new with Lord Miller? Well, they got a new project up their sleeves. They, their next movie is, a is, is going to be focusing on a classic movie character. They're developed in an, an untitled monster project, Ooh, described as a modern day tongue in cheek thriller inspired by Universal's classic monster, classic monster legacy with Channing Tatum set to star. They've worked with Channing before, of course, in the um, 21, 21 and 22 Jump, Jump Street yep. films. Reed Carolyn had the original idea for the project and wrote the treatment. Wes Took is writing the script. Lord and Miller have stayed busy though after over the past several months of quarantine on both film and TV projects. We've actually spoken about a few of these on the podcast. Over the summer, they signed on to star in the untitled astronaut action pick in MGM starring Ryan Gosling. Their Apple TV series, The After Party, just announced an all-star cast, including Dave Franco. I'm guessing the all-star cast is everyone else, right? Right. 
<laughs> and they're also developing a reboot of Clone High over at MTV Studios. So they are busy, busy boys. Right. Uh, do note that they are not currently signed on to direct said project, only to produce. Mm-hmm. But should their schedules align, they could direct this. And seeing them take on a horror comedy could be interesting. So what monster? They didn't say. Yeah. What do you think? What do you think would make the best movie? What do you see, want to see come back? Uh, I think they do... The easiest comedy routine to do would be a Frankenstein comedy. Frankenstein works. Or The Mummy. But they, they just, just did re- that mummy, mummy reboot. I think it's too right. soon. The mummy's too hot. They can't. They have to wait for the mummy to cool down. Right. Um, um, or you do see. a new adaptation of Teen Wolf, but I don't think you have Channing Tatum as said Teen Wolf. No, I could see... Because Channing Tatum is kind of the, the wrench of the works, right? Because I can't picture him with a, in a Frankenstein movie either. Unless he's Frankenstein, then that's kind of brilliant. Right. That's the only way I can yeah. see it happening is he is Frankenstein. He is Frankenstein. It's monster. Like Frankenstein's monster. We should say. <laughs> because I there's hear pe- you there's pedants out there. <laughs> there's pedants out there that are probably like, well, it's actually it's Frankenstein's monster. But... Right. I could see like a sort of tongue-in-cheek uh was it geeks Freak, not freaks and geeks uh <laughs> that's something else that is something else entirely uh why am i when i think of geeks or, are you struggling no, revenge of the nerds revenge of the nerds i'm thinking of okay. revenge of the nerds where they um create a frankenstein like monster with channing tatum's body uh okay well, let's not have that happen. <laughs> right. Chantino <laughs> is getting up there in age. That, I mean, depends on your definition of, of an age, but okay. Right. I mean, he is still looking good for an age, whatever age he is. <laughs> but who's not looking good anymore is uh, Johnny Depp. Yes, thank you for that wonderful segue. Um, Next up in our movie news, we have an update about The Wizarding World. So as you mentioned, goodbye, Johnny Depp, as we previously reported here on the podcast. He has left The Wizarding World films. He will not be in the upcoming third uh, Fantastic Beasts film. But now we know who will in his place. Per an official release from Warner Brothers, the studio announced today that Mads Mikkelsen him of Rogue One, Star Wars Story, Hannibal, Casino Royale, uh, the video game Death Stranding, has been cast as <laughs> Dark Wizard Gellert Grindelwald in the third Fantastic Beats film. Mickelson was director David Yates' first choice to replace Depp in the role. Quote, the aim is to keep on track a picture that recently moved its original November 12th, 2021 release date to December 2022. The cast led by Eddie Redmayne and Jude Law are already shooting. Though Depp will not be appearing in the movie, he will be receiving the full eight-figure salary he was set to earn. He is not losing any money, I guess, as part of getting him to like getting him to go away. It was an all-or-nothing uh, contract when he signed. You, so he are you saying it was a? Day. Are you saying it was a pay-for-play contract? Yes, you could say that. We'll talk about those later. <laughs> Um, although that's not that's not a theme song anymore. We'll get there. It's not, it's uh, not there anymore. It's not in there anymore. They have new contracts. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, but yeah, he so he got paid, filmed yeah, one day, and then they let him go. Uh, yeah, that's what it says. According to the Hollywood Reporter, he filmed just one scene for the third film before being ousted. So there you go. Johnny Depp gets still gets his paycheck, unfortunately. But uh, Mads Mikkelsen, I think, is good casting here. I think that he needs to be in more stuff. So, yeah, let's do it. Why not? Plays a good villain in this role. Yeah, I could totally see this working. I have not seen the first two films, so I personally have nothing uh, invested in this film series. But, hey, I think it's a good choice. Now, do you try and make Mads Mikkelsen do a Johnny Depp impression? No, because no one should do a Johnny Depp impression. (laughs) Would you like to see my Johnny Depp impression? No, let's move on. Do you have watch any? Did you watch any movies uh, that came out in 2020 this week? 
dots. No, but I'll do my Johnny Depp impression where I exit the stage left. Ha 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 ha. There he goes. There he goes. And his little bubble camera set up there. Off off the side. All right, come back. We need to finish this podcast. Okay. Thank you. Okay. All I'm right. Done. That bit was uh, too long. <laughs> too long. Let's move on. Why don't we? Uh, into the world of television. And we always start the world of television with the sports corner it's sports time baby it's sports time and our first story coming from the sports world is about the match three which we talked about last week yes if you did not see the match one or the match two don't worry you don't need to see them to see this (laughs) sorry yeah no spoilers here um manning michelson curry michelson barkley michelson as well Mickelson and Michelson, they were both there. All benefit HBCU on Friday in the match three. Uh, those are historically black colleges and universities. So real quick, it's called the match three. Are they going to play a bunch of bejeweled? Mm, no, no, but expect a lot of diamond plaid socks. Okay. I, I mean, I'll expect it. This is golf in case yes. you didn't know. Um, and the people in um, refer we're referring to here are from multiple sports, not just golf. You have your Mickelson, but you also have your Peyton Manning. You also have your Steph Curry. You also have your Charles Barkley. Yes, Mickelson, pro golfer himself. Yes. With Peyton Manning, semi-professional golfer. <laughs> and, and now. Currently retired football player. Yeah. Not yet inducted into the Hall of Fame, but, uh, but he is currently a semifinalist, but yeah. probably for sure in ballot for this year. It'll happen. I don't, I don't see anyone putting a no vote for him, except for <laughs> that one reporter who put the one no vote for Derek Jeter. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that guy. Everybody hates that guy. Yeah, whoever that reporter is. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Steph Curry is an avid golfer and executive producer on Holy Moly. <laughs> yes, which is your favorite thing to mention about Steph Curry. It definitely is. <laughs> Nothing about his father being a basketball player. No. Or his <laughs> brother being a basketball player. Only his fascination with uh, reality television and um, mini golf. Yes. And then Charles Barkley, who has an infamous, terrible, a terrible, terrible <laughs> golf swing. <laughs> also he called out tom brady uh during the match two in mm. which brady holed out on an eagle an eagle chip and or a birdie chip it was part three on a birdie chip he holed out and basically made barkley eat his words so now he's out there to prove him wrong also tom brady's currently playing football and can't participate right <laughs> that is key here is that he was in the last one because there was no football happening um, right. So uh, also, watching... the last one was for COVID relief mm. fund, which it raised $25 million. Okay. So expect this hopefully somewhere around there. I would hope. Uh, so you will you be watching some of this? Probably. I have a whole golf weekend planned ahead of me. That's true. This is probably included in it. <laughs> Just televised. Um, yes, it's televised uh, for free on all Turner networks on Friday. Cool. The day after Thanksgiving, when your wife is usually out shopping, but not, not anymore wife. because she's uh, probably Black Friday shopping online because you can't do department stores anymore. Yeah, who who wants to go into into a store? Right. God forbid. Um. But Thanksgiving cool. leftover day. Indeed. All right. Why? Let's move on. Why don't we? To our second story in the sports corner here, we move from football players playing golf to football players playing football, or maybe not anymore, as we have um, our first elimination from the playoffs in the NFL, the New York Jets. Bye. Bye, Jets. So we're 10 weeks into the season. Mm -hmm. The New York Jets are 0 and 10. So even if they win all the rest of their games... (laughs) <laughs> they will not have enough to claim a spot in the playoffs. Yeah. Uh, so, Sayonara Jets. Have they're the first team officially eliminated and on a fast track to become the first pick in next year's NFL draft. <laughs> yes. 
they are taking for Trevor Lawrence. <laughs> <laughs> I guess so, huh? I guess so. Or looking story. for Lawrence. <laughs> yes, looking for Lawrence. Our next story is also about football. There will be three, count them, three Thanksgiving football games. Hit me with them. Uh, they are the Washington football team. Yes. Versus the Dallas Cowboys. Traditional uh, traditional um, game on yes. Thanksgiving. Just a little updated and modern this year. Yeah. Where the Dallas Cowboys may actually lose this time. It's possible. Uh, oh, also, also of note in that game, both teams have a backups quarterback starting. Oh. Because both of their starting quarterbacks at the beginning of the season have gotten injured since then. <laughs> Happens. Yep. Sometimes. So you have backup Alex Smith versus backup Andy Dalton. Or Basically. our favorite, Andy Aguilera. <laughs> Jeez. That's a pull. I haven't thought about that, that, that in a while. That was just for us. Whew, See, that joke will not play for anyone yep. else. <laughs> unless uh, unless friend of the podcast, Alex, is watching. Uh, <laughs> she would know. She knows that poster intimately. Yes, um, very much so. <laughs> <laughs> What's second and third games? Why don't you tell uh, the me? The second game is the Detroit Lions versus the Minnesota Vikings. Okay. Which they have a new man on the Minnesota Vikings. Okay. Yes. Um, but uh, <laughs> do not like expect year, that. That's like I'm, a year old joke at this point. It's it's still fresh, <laughs> right? I'm not like the old man pulling out joke from the '90s. No, no, it's not that old. Uh, anyway. But they'll be playing uh, the afternoon game. And, that's and then, it. no, and then that's two games. Yes. You said there's three. This says here on this sheet, there are three Thanksgiving football games with the asterisk. Do you not see the little asterisk? Okay. What's the asterisk mean? The asterisk means that the game that was supposed to be the night game, Steelers versus Ravens, the only good game in that bunch, uh-huh. has been pushed to Sunday due to positive COVID tests on the Ravens' backfield. Got it. Okay, so their backfield is in motion, but with virus inside of them. Yes, uh, uh-huh. their t- top two running backs have been quarantining since mm. Tuesday, since yesterday. That's a problem. That is a problem. And so they, the des- NFL decided to push its game back to Sunday. And they can't really push a game forward to Thursday. So. No, <laughs> not, nope. not how that works. Not how that works. Out. So two games only instead. Well, there you go. Sad. Oh, right. That means we can move off of uh, professional football and talk about college football. Just a real quick one. Yeah, the D League. Nick Saban? Do you not know how to say this name? Saban? Saban? There you go. Saban. You've, not, you've heard of Nick Saban before, right? No. Not before this moment? Not before, just now. Head coach of Alabama? Yeah, no. National winning title? No. Highest gov- paid government employee? No. No? No. no. <laughs> you know, there's, there's some days here. when I know you don't listen to sports. <laughs> this is one of them that just like, blows all those rest out of the water when would i ever find out who this person is every january when they won the national championship i have literally never watched a college football game on television in its entirety we we've been doing this for five years and yet still hasn't happened (laughs) You're, you're not gonna make me watch college football it's not gonna happen anyways head coach nick saban (laughs) For those of you listening, you probably know who I'm talking about. Yeah, well, he also tested positive for COVID-19. And, uh, of course, he has a bowl game coming up. Uh, Quote-unquote bowl game. It's Alabama versus Auburn in the classic Iron Bowl. That's a bowl. you have heard of the Iron Bowl, right? Uh, No. All right, I, I guess this is where we end the podcast at 25 <laughs> episodes. We've been doing this for how long at this point? You know I don't know. 
I don't know anything about college sports. <laughs> All right. So, yeah, Iron Bowl, great uh, classic game. Uh, mm. Classic matchup versus Alabama versus uh, Auburn without head coach Nick Saban. You got another collegiate, not athlete, staff, personnel to test positive since they started. There you go. Hey, are not staying as safe. They warned us. They warned us this was going to happen. We warned them this was going to happen. That too. <laughs> they said they would ways. be safe. We <laughs> said, no, you won't be. And Remember yet. how we talked about how Alabama was the first team to have like 10 positive tests yep. after a practice? Yep. Like the first week of practice? I can't go back from that. Nope. Anything else in sports before we move on to television news? Uh, the I briefly mentioned it in passing but Peyton Manning is one of several players currently in the semifinal rounds uh, okay. for the NFL Hall of Fame inductees for this upcoming year 2020 they will be announced prior the actual inductee will be announced during the Pro Bowl week prior to the Super Bowl so Got we'll it. get there yeah we will get there in January yep January Oh boy. Meanwhile, we're almost there. It's a month away. Can you believe it? I try not to, but yes. <laughs> Anything else in sports before we move on? Nope, we're good. All right. Time to talk about television news proper. And we start with a subject near and dear to our hearts um, Jeopardy. As we continue to learn how they are approaching their upcoming episodes in the wake of longtime host Alex Trebek's death. They announced that they will resume production with new episodes on Monday, November 30th, though a long-term replacement host has yet to be named. Jeopardy! will return to the studio with a series of interim guest hosts from the Jeopardy! family. The first, of course, will be Ken Jennings, uh, because, of course, that's who you start with because it's the obvious pick. I mean, they just Jeff signed him on for executive producer this season. Right. So he's there. He's in the building already. Mm -hmm. um, other guests have not been announced quite yet. I'm sure in the coming weeks we will, or coming days at this point, because that's coming up quick. Uh, we will uh, learn who else will be visiting the set. Uh, maybe they'll use this as kind of a tryout to see who fits the Jeopardy mold best. Uh, I'm really curious on who else the, who else um, are the guest hosts here. All right. If you had to name some guest hosts. What do you got? I think we, we've done this before, I think. Um, I think you came up with some good ones last time, but I don't remember who you were saying. Uh, the one on the internet, or at least the Vegas odds one that keeps popping up is Anderson Cooper. Okay, okay. But he's on uh, CNN, and that's not going to happen. because Yeah, he's really busy. Uh, Twitter was really gung-ho about LeVar Burton. Right, and that's uh, not... A thing either because it they probably could. want someone younger yeah i that's my opinion but i could see i could see him doing a guest host thing here yeah guest host yes uh but yeah i don't think he's permanent um if california is to shut down again and they won't allow travel i don't expect to see three contestants from california continuously oh yeah but rather i expect them to do something that millionaire did which is you bring in a celebrity host and do celebrity jeopardy yeah at which point will ferrell is an obvious shoe in <laughs> to come in <laughs> yes did you see um by the way they're doing abc is doing a celebrity wheel of fortune coming up soon yes i did so they're already basically doing that idea with other game shows so right um also speaking of ken jennings the his new show with brad rudder and yes um um the other dude the new guy yeah, James Hour, Mr. Uh, All In himself. Right. Um, we'll be doing The Chase, the Chase premiering in January. So I assume Jeopardy got a, an advanced taping of that, saw his skills, and was like, yeah, we'll give you a shot as our first host. Yeah. People like you. People like him. Well, we'll see who the guests are. Just one little additional uh, bit to this story. Uh, the, they announced an update to their broadcast schedule in regards to the episodes of, in regards to Al Alex's passing. 
Right. Uh, we had last reported that his last episode would air on Christmas Day, December 25th. That is no longer the case. It's being pushed to January. And instead, they will air 10 of his best episodes the weeks of December 21st and December 28th. Uh, the anticipated preemptions about Christmas and New Year's being the cause of this. Uh, Alex's last week of episodes will now air the week of January 4th in order to give his millions of fans a chance to see his final appearances. The first week of guest hosted shows will air the week of January 11th. Right, it makes sense because normally they ABC has uh, basketball games going on during those days. I'm sure those time slots are already taken. So you would have a Jeopardy show at 9 p.m. And you don't want to do that to Alex Trebek. Take him out of this time slot. So makes sense. You give him you give the two weeks to the best of in a build up tribute. And then during those two weeks, you can kind of hype up the final episodes as you get into the new year. Yeah. Smart, smart decision. Smart, smart stuff. I am excited to see um, some of this stuff, but of course, still sad because it just will never be the same. Mm-hmm. What also will never be the same is uh, uh, a, a certain uh, Comedy Central classic. I guess it's still, some people still call it a classic uh, that had its home on Netflix as it will no longer be around on that service. Chappelle show, uh, of course, Dave Chappelle's um, sketch show from the 2000s has been removed from Netflix, but don't worry, it wasn't Netflix's call. It was Chappelle's himself. He requested them to do so after he, quote, never got paid after leaving the Viacom CBS owned show. He says, quote, perfectly legal because I signed the contract. But is that right? I didn't think so either. That's why I like working for Netflix. So you know what I did? I called them and I told them that this makes me feel bad. And you know what they did? They agreed that they would take it off their platform just so I could feel better. Because if you're powerful, you get everything you want. Chevelle Show is still available, though, don't worry, on several Viacom CBS brands, including its original home, Comedy Central. I'm sure they have uh, uh, episodes on their website and their app, as well as CBS All Access and HBO Max, where it was recently licensed. So no one's losing Chappelle's show reruns. They're still there. You can still watch them, just not on Netflix. Right. This comes three weeks after Dave Chappelle made that comment on SNL during his monologue. Mm, I see. And then two weeks after he made another post on Instagram about it. I mean, say what you will about Netflix, but they listen to their creators. Uh, And so if somebody who has done stand up specials for them that are very lucrative uh, says something, um, Netflix is probably going to follow there. Right. I'm sure when he said that, their legal team went, wait, is this true? Yeah. Let's go looking through the contract. Let's call CBS up, what mm-hmm. their contract is with Chappelle show. Yeah. And sure enough, they didn't like what they saw and <laughs> probably went to Dave Chappelle saying, you were right. What would you like to do? We <laughs> would like to be in business with you. We bought the show because we thought you'd get paid and we like having you on our platform. Yeah. So this is one of the rare instances where Netflix does good. Yeah. I guess so. Um, if you care about Dave Chappelle in 2020, which I certainly do not. Let's move on to television thoughts. You watched some television this week. I watched some television this week. One of these shows is something we both watch. Another of these shows is something I plan to watch tonight. So give it to me. What do we got? All right, let's start with the one that you're gonna plan on watching tonight. Okay. Lego Star Wars, a Christmas. That's not it, but let's talk about Lego Star Wars. Wars yes. the Christmas special. Yes. So let's get this one out of the way. Is this because... a Lego version of the Star Wars Christmas special, the lost special that only aired once on television? So it is based off of that, um, where they go to the planet of Kashyyyk, Chewbacca's home world, and they celebrate Life Day, which is their yes. Christmas special. Right. But they don't uh, necessarily stay around for it because they use this as their way to get uh, everyone's favorite character, Ray Skywalker. <laughs> and I say that because this is post uh, right. uh, Return of the Jedi. 
No. <laughs> Revenge of the Skywalker. Rise of the Skywalker. <laughs> you got there. You got there eventually. <laughs> I gotta find the end one somewhere. <laughs> so this is post uh, the Rise of Skywalker. Uh, so, and they make that very clear in the beginning where they have certain characters that show up in that film show up mm. here. So, so you know where this takes place in the timeline early on. And she's trying to train Finn to use his force sensitive powers. But in order to get help, she needs help from her master. Sure. And her master's master. And oh. her granddad's master. Wow. Her granddad's master master. There's too many masters here. Yes, but there's only one way to make that happen. Time travel shenanigans. All right. Time travel. Love to see it. Yeah. So, so is this very Christmas? Uh, no. I mean, it has <laughs> Christmas stuff interspersed, but it's mainly a way to have Ray interact with different famous scenes throughout the Star Wars universe. Okay. And that's more of what it's a vehicle for. Got As it. the ending is always, you had the power inside you the whole time. Yes, uh, cue the hugest eye roll you've ever <laughs> seen. Yeah, that's very, yeah. That's very par for the course, though, for this these characters after that last movie, for sure. Yes. That being said, I liked it better than I thought I was going to like it. Is I it better than Rise of the Skywalker? Times. I chuckled a few times. I was like, huh. <laughs> that's good there and in typical lego fashion it is heavy on the slapstick comedy yeah yeah but also you get the chance to revisit some iconic lego star wars moments yeah and be like heh i see what you did there heh tongue-in-cheek commentary <laughs> heh memes yeah because the lego the lego stuff is a way for them to play around a little bit more than they could can in the other star wars right fiction so I'm lego star wars that. is canon to its own lego universe right where everything is more humorous than anything you could possibly throw at it right you don't have and to I be think as did a pretty good job at writing a lot of humor into it yeah. sometimes forced humor but most of the time it's that chung and cheek haha only real star wars fans would get that type of humor speaking of that kind of humor well actually let's do the other one first so we and then to say about the let's other one? end on the one that we have probably a lot to say about all right speaking of tongue-in-cheek humor then yeah <laughs> taylor swift yeah she's hilarious yes known for her <laughs> great stand-up routine <laughs> honestly though her- honestly though i would love to see taylor try stand-up She'd be all terrible her, at it. All her jokes are written in verse. <laughs> <laughs> just she's just out there jamming away on a guitar. She's just she's a poet, but not a comic. <laughs> anyway, so yes, you watched Folklore Colon, the Long Pond Studio Sessions, which was surprise announced yesterday and then launched last night at midnight. Oh, I didn't know this because I specifically logged on to Disney Plus to mm-hmm look at the Lego Star Wars Christmas special. And it <laughs> was see. like, oh, what is this, this is here thing too. staring me in the face banner? Would you yeah. like me to watch Taylor Swift? <laughs> so yeah, um, this was, she actually announced it on Twitter about midday yesterday. That's where I saw it. And yeah, I was not going to stay up until midnight to watch this thing. I was like, nah, I'll watch it tomorrow. So um, this is kind of a full-length movie because it's about hour 40. I mean, it's... a. Uh, it's probably it's the length of the album and then then some because there's additional content that's my understanding of it because if you don't know what this is this is basically a fly on the wall look of uh, a studio session of taylor singing songs from folklore and it actually involves a couple of her producers on the album aaron Dessner of the national and jack antonoff i think bon iver bonnie bon iver is there too uh for exile they're in spirit oh he's he's there remote He's there remotely. Okay. I haven't seen this yet. Uh, I plan on but watching this. That's all that there is. I mean, that's what I'm it not is. I'm saying that it's a bad thing. Yeah, that's I'm what she that said it was going to be. Them. Yeah. It's the three of them being filmed at the Long Pond Studio. Yeah. Which is an actual studio. Right. Because Folklore was created in quarantine. Yeah. 
where Taylor Swift created a makeshift uh, studio in her uh, house and worked with these people via Zoom and chats and stuff to create Folklore, the album. Mm -hmm. And because no one's on tour and she can't tour with it, she's never played it in full for anyone until now. Right. So this was, or at least that's how the opening goes. This is kind of the next step, right? Because the last thing she did uh, prior to Folklore's release to kind of take advantage of the um, difficulties of quarantine was she put out that Lover concert she did in Paris after that album's release because she can't tour, she could, because she could tour on Lover anymore. So this is her, hey, I can't tour on Folklore. I can't do any other performances really besides, I guess, award shows. I have pretty much could put down money that she shows up on the, at the Grammys in February. Uh, but for now, um, this is what she can do. And so, yeah, she already has this existing relationship with Disney Plus after that Lover in Paris mm -hmm. concert. So here we go. And that's basically what it is. Yeah. It breaks, it's interstitial with like how the song was created, what the song is about, mm -hmm. little quirks about the song. But the interstitial between her playing the song with the two producers and writers yeah. in the room. Quick question. Answer. I haven't watched this yet. So how do they how do they broach the explicit songs? Does she sing radio edits? No, they, they drop the F bomb. Really? It's this special is no no, I mean they drop the audio oh, on they... the F bomb. <laughs> so so it's edited. It's, okay. Dis it's edited. It's Disney. Favorite. Edited for Disney. But Plus. you can see her mouth the word. That's an interesting choice there because I would. That makes me wonder what she intended this fo footage to be. Like, did she intend this to be a series of YouTube videos? Like, what did she intend this originally to be? Because there's no way that this was ori like originally intended for Disney Plus with that because that sounds very something that Disney would not have been a would have not have approved. But. You say that, but this was directed by Taylor Swift. Yes, yeah, I, yeah, but. And produced by her what studio I'm, album. What I'm saying is that what Taylor wants production? probably, I imagine what Taylor wants in 2020 probably butts against what Disney Plus wants in 2020 is what I'm saying. So I don't think Taylor having creative control matters. I think that she put this thing out. She wants it to be what was put out. I think if this was on literally any other streaming service, it would have gone up unedited. I mean, the Netflix uh, documentary, uh, her Netflix documentary, Miss Americana, Americana, features her dropping the F-bomb. So Right, and because she worked with both, I think she probably pitched it to both. I wonder. That makes and me, Disney yeah. Said, we'll give you more money, but you have to mm -hmm. drop these words here. Okay, you're probably that right. Sounds you're probably right. Yes, Disney was right. like, we want this, but hey, could you do us a favor? <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, interesting, nonetheless. Um, we'll talk more about folklore later in the show. Yes, but if you like <laughs> that album, watch this. This uh, is if that. If you like Miss Americana, if you like mm -hmm. the other Taylor Swift in Paris, yeah, or Lover in Paris, yeah. watch this. Even if you just want it on in the background while you do something else. <laughs> the no, little thought... interstitials are kind of worth it. Yeah, I fully intend on watching this at uh, some point, maybe tonight, maybe tomorrow. Probably not tomorrow because I'll be with somebody who's not a fan. Uh, but <laughs> I know. but uh, I'll, I'll, I'll make it, I'll fit it in at some point. Right. It is definitely worth a watch. Um, like I said, it's Taylor Swift with Jack Antonoff and what's his name? Edward. Aaron Dessner. Yes, that's not. <laughs> yes. All right. Uh, but yeah, it's just the three of them jamming out to the album Incomplete from start to finish. And they do it pretty well. Good job. No, that sounds great. Yep. All right. Are we ready to move on to the last show that we watched? Are you saying it's time? <sighs> it's time. It's time for Animaniacs. All right. Okay. First question. I have two questions for you to start this this chat. One, have you watched all of it? I have watched 
10 or how many episodes? There's 13 episodes. There are 13. There are 13 in this. Season. I've watched 12 out of the 13 episodes. Okay, then you're not that last one. I hmm. I'm trying, I'm trying to th- trying to think of like how important it is in this co- to this conversation that you watched that last episode. Yeah, it's fine. No, no, I skipped, idea. I skipped episode eleven to perfectly uh, watch twelve. Okay, so you watch the last one, then you're fine. Yeah. Um, second question. Just want to take your temperature on this thing. Did you come out on the other side with positive thoughts or eh thoughts? I came out with middling thoughts. <laughs> Okay, good. I think we're mostly on the same page then. Uh, so you want to talk? You want to talk about the how you felt about this thing first? Then so from the first couple notes when they do the new intro, you can kind of tell that they seem older. The voice I, actors, yeah, voice so, actors. That's the thing is the choice that they made to, to stick with the original voice the original actors. voice actors. I get it. One, I understand why you would come to that conclusion. But the problem with that is, is that yes, uh, what they could do 30 years ago almost <laughs> is not what they can do currently. Um, you you notice there's a lot of dropped octaves. The harmonies that they used to be able to do don't do the same thing that they used to do. And yeah, Rob Paulson specifically, his Yakko sounds like a Yakko in his 60s, which is unfortunate, but it's the reality of the situation. It's what you do. And it does, it's the most glaring, well, I don't know. His 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 Yakko and Tress McNeil's dot singing voice are the two most glaring things about Those are the reboot. two that I noticed right Those off the the two bat. most notable thing where... Tress has to drop an octave in several of the songs that she'd never had to do before. Um, And you notice it immediately, which is weird. But it's what you get with 30 years. Yeah. And yeah, a lot of voice strain. Yeah. But anyway, uh, what other thoughts did you have? Um, I liked that they are very meta and tongue in cheek, and ex- at I think episode five expressed exactly what I was thinking going into episode five, which is where's the rest of the cast? Yeah, because there's Yakko, Wacko, and Dot, then there's Pinky in the Brain, mm. and then that's it. Yeah. They're the focus. Uh, There are, we should note, two brand new segments that are introduced for this. Uh, One that I think is stronger than the other. Uh, But yeah, um, they do seem like they have plans on continuing down a Animaniac, like like the same style as the original, where there are other stories with other characters. It's just they didn't do it a whole lot because they know that what most of the audience is looking for right now is the Animaniacs, the titular stars. So they right. focus did, mostly on them. I did think it was very tongue in cheek that when you start the reboot, you one, explicitly do a song about it being yeah. a reboot. And then two, if you're going to start at the beginning, go ahead and start at the very beginning doing a Greek god, Odysseus, Mm -hmm. Iliad, take, Animaniacs take. Yeah. Um, So overall, here's here's my feeling about about this series. I guess we never really said it, but this is the Hulu reboot of Animaniacs. Oh, we don't have to say it. They (laughs) see it themselves several times. They do. They make it very clear of what this is. Um, My overall feeling about this thing is not too dissimilar to when I talked about the Looney, the new Looney Tunes cartoons on HBO Max from earlier this year. Just like the Looney Tunes ones, it seems like this was made by writers and animators who really, really, really respect and revere the original source material. Mm-hmm. And so what they've created in both instances are things that look so close, look so close to the original, but in a modern style 
that if you were maybe walking by the TV and heard it slash maybe saw a glimpse of it, you might think it's the original thing, but you might wonder why it's in widescreen. Um, so they nail the style. They nail the style almost perfectly. I think even though the animation is slightly mod more modern, they do things throughout the, the, throughout the season that are that they don't even need to do anymore that they do just explicitly because they did it in the original. Like close-ups are done in the painting style where you can mm -hmm. kind of see, even though that's not how it's animated anymore, it's all digital, they don't need to do it that way. But you can tell that they loved how close-ups are done so well in the original series that they wanted to replicate it in digital, even though it doesn't make any sense to do that. So painstaking detail is in this thing in almost every single episode. The animation is impeccable because of it. It's some of the best digital animation you're going to see, period. They spent the money. And that was one of the questions we had going into this, right? When we talked about it previously on this podcast is, are they going to spend the money for the animation? Answer is yes. Are they going to spend the money for a live orchestra? The answer is also yes. In fact, they did, they spent so much money on it. They're like, well, let's do an entire episode, which I think is actually the strongest short in this entire season mm -hmm. about the live orchestra, which yeah, is when a brilliant it started with just the orchestra and no dialogue. Yeah. I was like, oh, are they really going to go this route? Can they do this? And it works. But I think that that sketch, though, the fact that I think that sketch is the best sketch in the entire season, though, is probably all you need to know about how I felt about this season. I was severely disappointed with the quality of the writing. Um, I think what I wanted this thing to be and what it actually is are at odds with each other. They do as you mentioned, the meta stuff. They do it so much that it's like almost drags the whole thing down, in my opinion. I think, yes, if you go back to those original shows, yes, they did that, but they didn't do it nearly as much. And I think that with it, they use it as a crutch here. And it feels like where they could just have the story be the funny part, they don't trust their storytelling ability enough to let it go. And so every step of the way where they can break the fourth wall, they do. Like, I don't think the original series relied on that as much as they their memory of the original series is. It's almost like a game of telephone with the original series of Animaniacs, where they well, there's the thing you think it ago. was, and there's the thing it actually was. When you go back to it, as we did fairly recently when they put it on Hulu, it's not that far in that direction it's they're still telling cartoon stories in the cartoon about the cartoon stories i don't know so i think one of the things that i noticed is that during the original animaniacs run it felt like each individual interstitial comedy bit mm -hmm. was kind of like a film something like filmed on the lot of warner brothers and so you would occasionally have a reason for the Animaniacs mm -hmm. to run across in the background, or you have other characters show up in the background or accidentally yeah. appear and make a joke because they're all on the same lot. And that doesn't exist here. That doesn't exist here. This feels no. like a Looney Tunes style. We're doing this bit, this bit, this bit. Which I mean, is I guess closer to the original like source material, which is the Looney Tunes. Like Animaniacs was and always, and. It, that is still is basically a modern interpretation of the Looney Tunes format. That's what it always was. Uh, and so the fact that they rebooted both of those things in the same year and you can compare and contrast uh, really points out the things that the problems I have with this that I didn't have with that. I think they're way more successful with the Looney Tunes shorts. And I bet there's probably a lot of crossover with animation talent between the two projects, if I had to guess, because that's the same studio. Um, right, but where Brothers animation. That one succeeded because they were able to tell their own stories. Uh, here, I think, like I said, I think that the comment, the meta commentary, is is too heavily applied. Um, but even if it wasn't, I still don't think it's that funny. That's another problem where I had about it. I was thinking back over thirteen episodes of watching this thing. I was like, did I laugh that much? And I don't think I did. I think I maybe had. The occasional chuckle. I think a guaranteed chuckle that I had was the stinger in the opening, because those are always funny. You know, where they 
it's the whatever rhymes with zany at the end right. there those are always good because there's a they can't, you can't write a bad one of those because it's funny every time but like the actual laughs coming from the actual shows i don't know if it made me laugh that much i didn't think it was that great um i think that yeah stylistically i think they're losing something without having some of those classic interstitials i think you're i think they're losing right. something because they're leaning too heavily on yeah. the warners and pinky in the brain because you get a warner yeah. a pinky in the brain a warner and then that's it and so yeah i feel and like you done. had what made the original one work a little better was that they had kind of like a palate cleanser mm -hmm. um, and there were so many options that they had i get why you wouldn't want to go that direction because one it's say it's probably cost saving on voice acting and two there's maybe some characters you can't do in 2020 like, I don't think you can do uh, the Rita and Runt sketches anymore because Runt's basically Rain Man, which I don't think you can do a <laughs> funny Rain Man bit in 2020 anymore. So I'm sure that they right, kept running. Course, I think, but you have so many new musicals you can riff off of. Yes, which brings me to a, the, another question I wanted to ask you. What did you think about the new short? And we'll, we'll talk about Pinky and the Brain. That's the next thing I want to touch on. But... But what do you think about the new short the with the alien and the little girl? I like the animation. It reminded me a lot of Steven Universe animation. The quality of the, yeah. Of the quality the, the definitely world. shifted between the Animaniacs and that little short. Yeah. I like that they were willing to try a different style with that. Mm -hmm. I thought it was really good. I actually thought that was one of the highlights of the, I think there's potential if they do continue uh, with that, with the ideas in that short. Um, and the fact that it was new and original and it wasn't relying on breaking the fourth wall, I think actually let it be funny. It did remind me of Mindy and Buttons where a bit. Buttons is trying to get Mindy back to home. It is similar. It's similar. Yeah. But it's also not relying on you realizing that's a Lassie parody. Right. <laughs> yes. That's maybe that's the other reason why they can't really do that one anymore. Um, what you... I think that might be one of the other things that they need to parody off new stuff. And can you do that within 20 years? I mean, the question that I, yeah, the question that I had going into this was what are they going to, how are they going to approach the references? And right. I think the answer was, is that they did aim towards modern whenever they got the option to which made some of the stuff feel really weird. Like, I'm not really sure why you need to take a giant dump on Seth Meyers. What did Seth Meyers do to you? And stuff like that were like the targets that they chose beyond, of course, President Trump, because of course, but the other modern targets that they chose to focus on just were bizarre to me. I'm like, where? why did they land on these choices? Like, I don't know, just personally, like, you have Seth Meyers named by name, but then you go to have a fake Rachel Maddow later in the series. Like, right. I don't understand why when when they do choose to punch and when they pull their punch and why, like, why are they punching? <laughs> it's like, <I'm, laughs> and none of the Fox, like when they do a Fox News parody, they don't go with like, like name recognition except for a fake um, uh, Tucker Carlson. Right. Uh... And it's like, why a fake Carl Tucker Carlson, but a real Seth Meyers? It's so confusing to me. I don't know. Um, just the targets. Yeah, there's just there's a lot of there's not a whole lot of logic between like why they do the jokes they do uh, with the references. So they ended up not feeling that great to me. Um, also, there's not like an entire short dedicated to be a parody of something, which I think is one of the things that worked in Animaniacs. They didn't even bother. Here. Uh, I think the only one they did was Murder on the Orient Express. And even that, they even mentioned within the episode that they've done already. And now that already. And, <laughs> and it wasn't even really that. It was like kind of further, like a few steps beyond it. Right. All right. Uh, they did do new animation in it with uh, the anime and the bunny yeah parody the bunny yeah that was an interesting shit. take that 
didn't have to they didn't have to do that they just chose to there's no mm -hmm. reason to do that i would have preferred if that was an entire sketch like if that was the premise for an entire sketch i would that would have made more sense to me i don't know why they wasted a good idea in the middle of a sketch that was already a thing right and then they did the uh everything's cute mm -hmm. yeah I, I, I liked that one more i think i think that was one of the more successful sketches because again, the humor came from what was actually the story itself. This humor came from the storytelling. It wasn't reliant mm -hmm. on pulling out that pulling back the curtain. Um, right. Okay, I last think... thing. Yeah. Last thing we should talk about is the thinking of the brain stuff. So mm -hmm. it seems like the internet consensus is that the thinking of the brain stuff is more successful than the animaniac stuff. You mean it deserves its own spinoff? Almost like it always did, um, <laughs> and got it for a while there. Uh, how'd you where'd you land on it? Uh, in the middle because they're doing the same thing they did every night, Pinky. <laughs> I they try to take over the world. Yeah, I also like that they kept it pretty much the same because if it's not broken, why fix it? Right? It's like the thinking of the brain formula works because it's a classic formula. Um, and I think for the most part, it works here. But again, I just don't think the writing is as strong. And so even the episodes that should be like, even the episodes where they tried to have like a poignant event happen, like even the ones where they're like, no, we want you to care about the characters, which is something that the Animaniacs shorts don't do, but it's something that the Pinky and the Brain has classically done, especially when it was a spinoff show. I mean, for God's sake, they tried to do Pinky and the Brain as a primetime show on the WB in the mid nineties because they knew it could play on multiple levels. And there's genuinely good episodes with actual drama when you go back and look at that show that they were able to do because you did care about these characters. When they try that same thing here, it doesn't work. And I just think it's just the, the strength of the writing is just, it's just not there. Now, I think you're right that there was something that was very rote about it. Mm -hmm. And then also something that became stale the more they did it. The one thing that I did like that Pink and Brain did was the um, first mouse uh, character that they brought in. Well, that's what I, that's specifically the episode I was talking about. Right. And, and then they never bring her back. <laughs> yeah, which I was expecting. Because that I was just, the first new character that they brought in right. into the Animaniac series reboot. Yeah. I was like, yes, new character. Right. Yes, this is good. This is what I want. And then never seen from again. They set her up as a villain, which is interesting because again, it echoes something they did in the original series mm -hmm. was they had an episode set up a villain and then they actually had that villain recur. If this gets a second season, I'm sure we'll see her again. Uh, right. but, but maybe in one, maybe two episodes. Yeah, exactly. It doesn't seem like something they're going to rely on, but that's probably for the better. Um, but I think it's interesting um, that they even tried it at all because that's a big swing uh, for the first season of your thing. Like, I don't know. Um, so yeah, overall, I just, I'm not feeling it. And I was really hoping that I would like it. There's things that I like about it, but ultimately I came out, came out thinking that I liked the Looney Tunes, the new Looney Tunes stuff better than their Animaniac stuff. Uh, hopefully we, Tiny it's... Tunes will fare better. Right. I think it's because <laughs> we like Animaniacs as a tongue-in-cheek parody of things, and there was a whole lot of parody in his, in this. But I also think that, but that's the thing, is I don't think it was just the parody that worked. It was the cavalcade of characters that you got with it, too. It was that, and just, I think that there was just better storytelling. And I think they lose some of the story here. And I think that that's it, too. It's, it's almost like they... And I get why you would do this. It's almost like that the last decade of television animation didn't happen. But it did. And that's the thing is that I wish that this Animaniacs would, would be aware, more aware than it is that animation has changed. But maybe that's too much to wish for. <laughs> Uh, quite anyway. maybe possibly I'm not sure I don't know, I don't know. but so, it, yeah. well, there will be a second season so I, I'm sure yes the, that's guaranteed so we'll yeah. see if they are able to pull out something 
something more, maybe some additional uh, original shorts. Um, that'd be nice, but we'll see. Yep. So overall, just a stream yeah. it. Just a meh. I'm like a meh on it. Um, I honestly, and also real quick, if you were planning on showing this to your kids, maybe don't. <laughs> They really take advantage of that TV PG rating. Like it's a, it's not it's not for children in a lot of the cases, which is also something I just I guess I didn't expect. Like I knew I know that they did some little more extreme things on the original series as well, but this takes almost takes like that kernel and then runs with it in a lot of the cases with some jokes that I didn't ever think that they would get away with. Um, so yeah, so just parent be warned, just to. Just a heads up. You have been warned. <laughs> All right. Well, that's it for television thoughts. Unless you watch anything else that you want to talk about, get off your chest now. Um, no, nothing that I watched that is significantly of note. Just that um, if you liked fall TV, you're going to have to wait because it's going away. <laughs> uh, come next week. Um, Fall TV is going to be take its winter break yep. and we'll be stuck with reruns again. So enjoy so it all. Get you excited. Can. All right. Well, with that, let's talk about some other things you're watching and or not watching anymore in cancellations and renewals. What am I no longer watching? Well, I'll tell you what you're still watching slash no longer watching because the CW has said that Black Lightning, its fourth season, will be its last. That is its current fourth season, the one that's Premiering, has premiered, will premiere? Something. Right. <laughs> a Prime Video also will be ending a show, The Expanse, after six seasons. Uh, it, that is before its fifth season airing next week. It will get one more season. So technically you get two. You get this upcoming fifth and then the sixth. And if I and this will be its second cancellation. Yeah, if I remember correctly, it was on Sci-Fi, canceled there, picked up by Amazon. You're correct. Okay. Pop has canceled the, I don't know how you've written this. It's called One Day at a Time. Yes, no, I see that part. I'm confused about the can the one season slash four season thing. Uh, uh, it, it canceled one season on Pop, but it's fourth season overall. Oh, right, because it was had three on Netflix. That's right, Netflix right. Where, is where it was. So yes, One Day at a Time, the Netflix reboot, got off of Netflix, moved to Pop. Well, it's already been canceled after that one season. So much for that. So it's more like one season at a time. That <laughs> sounds like Or it. one network at a time. There you go. But, um, there it is. There's my Animaniacs joke. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. Then we do have a couple of deaths, unfortunately, to talk about real briefly. First up, Kirby Morrow, age 47, a voice actor. You might know him as the, in the stable of Canadian voice actors doing anime adaptations, including the original uh, dub of uh, Dragon Ball Z, Inuyasha, and more recently, Lego Ninjago. Yes, he was the Canadian voice of Goku. Yes, Canadian Goku. It is then, weird to say. It's a weird thing to say. And then, uh, yes, uh, uh, if you're trying to find where the Canadian dubs are, that is an ocean dub. Yes, yes. Thank you for filling in the, my one gap of knowledge in that, <laughs> that situation. <laughs> then next, um, I underscore O, I O. I'm not really sure how he stylizes it uh, or stylized it, unfortunately. Has passed away. He was a techno DJ, age 30, uh, famous for the song Violence. Yeah, I worked with Dead Mouse a lot. So, so, yeah, 30. That's real young. I saw this one this morning. I think this happened today. Uh, I think it was yesterday. Maybe yesterday. I think I saw it yesterday or last night. But anyways, um, let's move on to music, shall we? Why don't we? All right, I'm going to start uh, music with the billboard. And we start the billboard with the Hot 100. Feeling hot, hot, hot. And your oh, hottest single songs. in the land is Mood by 24 Golden, <laughs> featuring Ian Dior. It's still up there, still on top. Um, so I watched them perform. Actually, that is something that I did watch 
the American Music Awards. But I guess you we'll talk about those? that in a bit. Well, good. You're, you'll help in a story in just a moment. <laughs> but uh, but yeah, did he? Yeah. Did they show up? Uh, yeah, they showed up. They definitely um, performed. They definitely were there. They were there. <laughs> I think they performed a mood, but I couldn't understand what but they who were knows? saying. Who knows? I don't know. Maybe. Maybe. Um, at number two, and probably disappointed this week, Therefore I Am by Billie Eilish. Yeah, that's her new single. Um, I saw it briefly at the in, at the, in the portion of the uh, AMAs that I was able to watch. Okay, I saw the YouTube video for this when it premiered, and I was like, oh, it's a one-shot of her in an empty ball. Mm-hmm. Because you can do that kind of thing now. Yeah, it was it was all right. Uh, I thought the song is uh, pretty catchy. I think that's going to be a hit. Yeah, they're... Predict. ESPN has already taken it and is playing it in front of the college games. Well, there you go. Um, much like they did with her other hits. Uh, number three, Positions with Ariana Grande. At four, I Hope by Gabby Barrett featuring Charlie Puth. Yep. And rounding out your top five, Laugh Now, Cry Later by Drake featuring Lil Durk. Lil Durk. As for your albums chart, you have Billboard 200. 200. What year is it? I don't know. You tell me. No, no, that's the name of the album. What year is it? No, it's not. No, it's not. <laughs> it is Power Up by ACDC. Yeah, that yes, ACDC. That ACDC. They're still putting out number one albums. Turns out. Which means everyone else on this list is pretty pissed that they lost <laughs> out to ACDC. <laughs> I don't know. You tell it to future. Uh, well, I'll tell him right now because he's number two. Pluto X Baby Pluto by Future featuring <laughs> Lil Uzi Vert. Yeah, I'm really not sure who's Pluto and who's Baby Pluto in this situation, but who knows? And and why Pluto? Yeah, why Pluto? Hmm. No idea. Do you want to get kicked out of the solar system? Yeah, I know I do. No longer count future. <laughs> At number three, Starting Over by Chris Stapleton. Yep. At number four, Positions by Ariana Grande. And rounding out the top five, Shoot for the Stars, Aim for the Moon by Pop Smoke. Yep, your usual suspects here, except for the new ones in the top three. Yep. If you didn't like any of those albums, we have new releases. We sure do. Including some names you've probably heard of. Maybe. Yep, like Weight of the False Self by Hate Breed. <laughs> Can't say I've heard of that one. No. How about No Fun Mondays by Billy Joe Armstrong? That Billy Joe Armstrong? That Billy Joe Armstrong. Of the greenest of days. Yes. And no relation to Neil Armstrong, even though people keep saying it. Or Billy or Billy Eilish. (laughs) Or Billy Eilish. (laughs) (laughs) Different Billy. Yeah, different Billy altogether. Uh, we also have plastic heads. I mean plastic plastic hearts hearts by Miley Cyrus. Yes, this is her, that Miley Cyrus. This is her pivoting once again into a rock direction because the girl can't figure out what she wants to do. So is this the 720 she did then? All the way back around? Yeah, the wrecking Third ball time? just, you, you, you toss it around this way so that the wrecking ball went in a circle. Well, it, it's not a mirror ball. No, that's very different. No, but she <laughs> wish she had a mirror ball. <laughs> And lastly, in new releases, Sire? I guess. Sire. You take Cry and you jumble it up in a blender. You get CYR. Yep. (laughs) Uh, By Smashing Pumpkins. Yes, those Smashing Pumpkins. Speaking of Billy's, uh, Billy Corgan wants you to still (laughs) still care about Smashing Pumpkins. This is also your reminder that if you still have a pumpkin out in front of your house now's the time to go smash it go smash it yeah exactly it's the best part of the year (laughs) all right 
Speaking of the best part of the year, <laughs> it's Grammy nomination time. It's award season, everybody. We made it. We did it. We made it. We are here with Grammy nominations. And some people are very happy. And some people are pissed. Oh, you mean Nicki Minaj? <laughs> oh, among others. We'll get there. We'll get there. Trust me. We'll talk about it. All right. Well, let's start with people who are happy. Yes. Like Beyonce who leads the contenders for the 2021 Grammy Awards. When she didn't even release a new album this year. <laughs> with nine, <laughs> an unexpectedly high profile, given that she didn't even release a new album during the eligibility period. No. So how is she eligible if she didn't release it during the period? She is nominated multiple times for a single Black Parade, and she right. is nominated for a visual uh visual categories for black is king which we talked about earlier this year right which black is king was an album last year for the lion yes. king she's also nominated because she does a she has a featuring credit on megan the stallion's savage remix oh under the remix category yes which is well there's no remix category but yes in, oh, no, in there is a remix category <laughs> well i mean there is but that's not what it is nominated for i believe it's nominated nominated for song of the year um uh, but yes she is involved she is technically nominated for that as well because she also co-wrote the song so this is like when everything was featuring drake and he was just nominated everywhere exactly so no, he didn't put out an album beyonce is leading here by default almost because having beyonce involved in your project means that it usually good things happen to it such as grammy nominations right and like well when we were texting about it the black parade <laughs> out of nowhere yeah I don't even remember. I don't know what this song sounds like. <laughs> so I don't either. I yeah. know that it's not that Black Parade that I'm thinking. No, of. it's not the Black Parade, which is different. Right, because she would have been welcomed to the Black Parade. <laughs> we, we all would have. We all would have we been would welcomed have. to the Black Parade. Anyway, but that's Anyways, not all. Anyways, her nod of nine is followed by six apiece for Taylor Swift. Roddy Rich and Dua Lipa. So yes, all those, three who have album of the year. Yes, real important note here. Taylor didn't get snubbed this year after two in a row of not receiving album of the year nominations for Reputation and Lover. She is finally back on top, finally getting Grammy recognition. Yep. Uh, Almost like she planned that this was going to happen by making an album like Folklore. Hmm, makes you think. <laughs> mean like when the studio just said yes to everything, just do what you want, and she did what she want? Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not a conspiracy theorist about Taylor Swift, nor, and nor am I like, nor am I against folklore. I think folklore is a great record. I'm sure we'll talk about it in their end of the year lists. That being said, she is also a very impeccable businesswoman and i'm sure that part of her decision to go in the direction she did with folklore was the critics will notice and sure enough they did so just saying i hate to be cynical about it but there's an element of taylor that knew this would work and it worked well here's me being cynical in <laughs> that i knew dua lipa would yes get the nomination because that record album future nostalgia it's a banger. It's a strong ass dance record that is not nominated for the dance category. <laughs> Just want to put that out there because when I saw that, I was like, all right. Well, I'm going to get everywhere for the pop categories. Right. It's all over in the pop categories, but for some reason, not dance. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. Other nominations include Brittany Howard of Alabama Shakes fame was close behind that grouping with five nominations yes. for her solo debut. She's all over the rock categories for that solo debut. Yes. I didn't know where, like, I was looking at the rock and alternative uh, mm -hmm. nominations. Like, who are you people? That makes sense now. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's Brittany Howard, yeah. Uh, also earning four nominations each were returning Grammy queen Billie Eilish herself. Yep. After a big sweep last year. Megan the Stallion, who yep. swept the American Music Awards. And who we'll talk about again in a few moments here. The baby. Yep. 
who was uh, all over the singles charts this year. B.B. Bridgers. Who is nominated for Grammys for the first time in her category. She's all up for Best New Artist, even though this is her sophomore release. And um, her album Punisher appears in the rock album category as well as uh, performance category, I believe, for her song Kyoto. Um, so yeah, big surprise for an indie artist like Phoebe Bridgers. Yeah. We also have Justin Bieber. Yep, um, who who's... tried and failed to reboot his career this year. Oh no, Dan and Shay are dragging his ass along. <laughs> Fair. Because they will probably win that the country song. Yeah, but does anybody remember Yummy? No, <laughs> but people remember Watermelon Sugar and that got nominated. That's Harry Styles. <laughs> Watermelon Sugar is in Harry Styles. Yes, it is. Look is it up. Jonas Brothers? <laughs> that is a Harry Styles song. Oh. I know it's super hard to tell because all those things sound the same. They're all the same. <laughs> no, um, no, Justin Bieber is <laughs> yummy is the only single he released this year. No, thank you. Uh, <laughs> we also have jazz pianist John Beasley and classical producer David Frost. <laughs> um, also, Jack Antonoff was nominated and will probably win producer of the year. Hopefully, we said that last year and he lost, so... Well, he lost crossed. to Billie Eilish's brother, who Billie Eilish won every award. Right. This year, Phineas is not nominated, so maybe Jack has a chance. Right. Also, anyone looking for The weekend's name amid Such the as pack, The weekend, who definitely was looking for his name. Right. Or lesser rewarded runner-ups, need look no further. Because mm -hmm. despite being widely predicted to dominate the nominations for the 63rd annual Grammys, uh, Blinding Lights single and After Hours album totaled to zero mentions. Snubbed. In what is sure to go down as one of the most shocking complete shutouts in modern Grammy history. All right. I mean, at least Gaslighter got a nomination. Yeah. The it's Chicks. It's in there somewhere. Or, sorry, the chicks. The chicks. Um, so yeah, this has taken on a life of its own as um, the weekend has gone all like just exploded over social media over this. He sees this as a uh, conspiracy against him. He has called out the Academy Recording Academy for having um, secret behind the scenes like cabals or something like he's just not happy about this to the point where the dude in charge of the nominating committee has gone on the record and basically said no nothing untoward is happening here everybody is considered like we didn't do this on purpose for the weekend so the it's weekend was <laughs> yes that's why uh the weekend was uh, scheduled to perform on the grammys uh not only of course to perform in the uh halftime show for the, the Super Bowl, like we mentioned last week. Um, but that performance is now called into question as The weekend himself says, there's like a quote attributed to him from earlier this afternoon saying that he believes that not being nominated means that he is also sees that as not being invited to the ceremony. So if he does have a performance scheduled, he might back out of it because he's throwing a whole fit over not being nominated. You mean the weekend who won the Moon Man VMA Awards? He, the same he weekend also, who won like, the American Music Awards? Yeah, that's the thing. The is same he's weekend who of, won the iHeart Radio Awards? Right, he's coming off of winning in three three ceremonies in a row for something to do with his album. So the fact that he's not nominated at all means... Right, and Blinding maybe, Lights is played everywhere. Maybe the competition was too fierce this year, but like... In a year well, where a Coldplay record okay. is up for album of the year, I think that that should have been the weekend spot. If you have to put up either Blinding Lights or Circles by Post Malone, which one do you put up? <laughs> so if you're asking me personally, I think Circles is the better song. <laughs> so I, I would that's where you. I think that's where the line hits. It's tough because, yeah, like... Yeah, a lot of people are saying that Post Malone's spot should have been the weekend spot. I don't agree. I think Post Malone showed a range that I don't think any of us thought he had. Uh, Post Malone beat the Beatles. <laughs> so, 
<laughs> so yeah, I mean, it's hard. It's like, it's, it, this is the same conversation that happens when anybody gets snubbed, which is like, man, that sucks. But I guess it was, it's gotta be hard. It's gotta be hard to, make, to drill down. That being said, there is definitely a conversation to be had about the album of the year contenders being extremely white this year. Uh, not a whole lot of black representation in the big categories. So there is the conversation to be had there. That being said, more women um, in this category uh, or in all categories this year uh, than before. Uh, the, one of the big stories to come out of this thing was that the rock performance category is all either female artists or female led bands, which is pretty cool if you ask me. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing is um, in the country categories, you see a lot more women uh, represented. Uh, media vote favorite Miranda card. Lambert, even though she got snubbed at the CMAs, as you mentioned last week, she is not snubbed here as she does have a country album nomination. Right. And Mara Morris, who just won a lot of the awards yes. for the CMAs, nominated once for the Bones. Yeah, country song. And I think she will win that. Looking at the competition, I think she will win that. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so overall, and you mentioned the other kind of snub that we noticed was uh, the Chicks is Gaslighter, not nominated here beyond uh, through Single. Jack Antonoff's nomination. Um, which, yeah, we when we talked about it on the podcast earlier this year, we thought it was a shoe in um, But mm -hmm. I think that just stands to how packed this year was. Um, and we've covered it. We've covered new releases and how good multiple albums come out. Uh, we didn't mention it here, but you mentioned off pod via when we were texting about it that you were uh, very happy for Himes uh, album of the year nominated for Women in Music Part 3, which I did mm -hmm. not anticipate that happening either. No. And something that no one ever anticipates, but I'm always happy to see. Pat Oswalt. Surprise Pat Oswalt in the comedy category. <laughs> you yes. always love it. <laughs> I love me a surprise Pat Oswalt. Always look out for him. So yeah, there's a huge conversation here. You mentioned Nicki Minaj is also pissed. Uh, you also see, um, uh, speaking of Justin Bieber, Justin Bieber up in arms on social media about how he's in the pop categories when he thinks he should be in the R&B categories. Right. Uh, but may. you don't hear from Kanye <laughs> because he did get the one nomination in the gospel category. Yeah, Kanye is nominated. Even though uh, apparently a couple months ago there was that tweet that he tweeted of self uh, peeing on a Grammy. <laughs> I don't know if you saw that. I didn't I did know not. that existed until today. Um, I don't think I want to know that exists. <laughs> that's out there. You want to see it. Um, so yeah, um, people are pissed, but they always are. And yes, there is a question about why do we do this to ourselves? Because I think if you listen to our conversation about the nominees, Last year, 2019's nominees, you probably also see a very rosy, like, hey, maybe it'll be good this year. And then flash forward to the actual ceremony and us basically taking a crap on it. So, what do you mean? We actually picked <laughs> the winner last year. No, that was two years ago. Golden Hour was two years ago? That was two years ago. Oh, that's right. Last year was all Billie Eilish. Yeah. That's why we took a crap on it. It was it, so it was every time the Grammys get me get me excited, they just let me down. So I'm looking forward to your album of the year winner, Post Malone, <laughs> in February of next year. All right. I mean, we did say a lot of Post Malone during our Billboard 100 and 200. It kind of ruled everywhere. Uh, also notable in it's uh, missing here, Little Baby, and my turn which was also the number one album for a billion months this year and is gone, is not nominated at all for album of the year. No, but you have Roddy Rich there, which kind of takes- Roddy Rich is the box is represented, right? Yes. <laughs> anyway. Anyways, enough of, of award shows. Let's talk about award shows. <laughs> yes, enough of award shows that haven't happened yet. How about one that just happened? I mean, one that happened Sunday? Was that a week ago? Was that, oh, that was last weekend, yeah. That was last weekend. Was the the American weekend. Music Awards. Or should they I say happen. the Canadian Music Awards. The Dick Clarks, back when Dick Clark was still alive. But right. they but were his idea. Like, he is the reason why they exist. Yeah, but Canadian artists basically dominated this year. Yeah. Weird. Was it really the American Music Awards? Mm, I don't know. Depends on who you ask. Uh, well, let's ask uh, Taylor Swift. Okay. And The Weeknd and Sh Dan and Shay. Well, Taylor's not Canadian. They got three trophies <laughs> each. It's true. In a show that proceeded along the lines of a typical annual 
AMA's telecast, while acknowledging that the live audience for this pandemic <laughs> edition consisted of a bare handful of masked cheering fans in the Microsoft Theater's balcony. I do have to say, the little portion of this I watched, I was actually shocked with how much volume you got from such a small amount of people. Like, I don't know if they were boosting the levels back in the production. They but had an actual mic them. hanging in front of them back there. Because, yeah, you definitely heard cheers just like a normal show, um, even though there were way less people. At least 20 feet in the balcony back there. Yeah. But, yeah, no, when they panned back, you could see the hanging mics that they okay. picked up, the, as they usually do from a live studio audience. Yes. Uh, viewers who preferred their awards telecast politically politics free finally had a 2020 show to pick not a single bone with politics free in 2020 that doesn't make any sense there's nothing happening though what could they pick at <laughs> everything's over everybody knows that yep. as joe biden himself tweeted america's back <laughs> right as trump tweeted that we stopped talking about everything going on now uh anyway. host taraji p henson Mm -hmm. set the tone in her introductory remarks, saying that, quote, we are one country. We need to heal. We need to love each other a <laughs> little more. And that's what tonight is about. Yeah, and also giving awards to musicians. <laughs> yes, recent or current events did not rear their head after that. Aside from a sniggering vote counting gag or occasionally fleeting allusions to the COVID-19 crisis like Doja Cat's parting admonition in acceptance speech to stay safe. I mean, Doja Cat is a special case here because she's had a wild 2020 when it comes to COVID-19. She was a denier and then got it and then recovered and then, re and then apologized to all her fans for being a denier. Right. Also, so, um, this was that. the first time that a lot of people probably saw Doja Cat in <laughs> person. Uh, much like me not realizing that one Doja Cat is not a group but a person. And also not a cat. Also not a cat. Also not a K-pop group like I thought. No. no. <laughs> also, uh, no, she was on the VMAs too. She did a full performance at the VMAs earlier this year. Didn't, didn't watch that. Well, I saw, I saw that. I watched a bit of it. Uh, but but yeah. overall, overall it was an okay show. I don't know. Overall I was fine with it. Uh, the weekend got his in mask form or bandage form. He's like yeah, all bandaged stuff. He's up. been doing the bandage thing lately. Yeah, not yeah. sure why. It's Maybe. part of the whole thing for his this album, right? All the music videos, he gets beat up. Okay, but do you have to carry it on? Yes, he does. Apparently, it's the bit. Yeah, it's the bit. It, it just keeps on doing the bit. Then keeps on doing the bit. Uh, but yeah, it was a fine award show. Um, Dan and Shay keep winning everything, and I'm kind of tired of it. <laughs> You're over Shay Dan and Shay pulling Dan along, or is it Dan pulling Shay along? Who who can say? I actually don't know which one is which. The long haired dude is that Dan or Shay? I don't know. Let me ask the the short one, the <laughs> balding one. Is that Dan or Shay? <laughs> Shay, and the tall one with the long hair is Dan. Yes, so it's Shay, okay. the short one, who pulls Dan yeah. along. So, so Dan is the one at the piano. Was the one at the piano, and Shay is the one that the is who is the like smash mouth looking motherfucker. Yes. Okay, got it. Okay, now I know. Yes, and both of them are dragging Justin Bieber <laughs> ten thousand hours across the finish line. <laughs> yes, he needs it. All right, let's stop talking about these award shows. All right. Uh, well, we already talked about two award shows. So, did you listen to anything? I did, actually. I listened to the same thing you did. Oh, good. You listened to a, the third award show. Well, oh. no. All Before right. we talk about more awards, we need to talk about an album that came out. Well, good news is the album by Megan the <laughs> Stallion. Yes. Megan the Stallion. Yes, Megan the Stallion, as I so eloquently put each and every week, she has been up on the top uh, 100s with uh, her new album, Good News. Yeah. So, so did you did you think this was good news when you listened to it? I went in with zero expectations. I okay. think I kind of expected it to be a lot like 
weird amongst people that song that she keeps putting out <laughs> WAP yeah but it is kind of like that it is um okay I don't know what your thoughts are okay but I'm going to tell you my thoughts that's kind of the point of this segment yes <laughs> I don't care for Megan Lee Stallion I don't okay. care for her rap all right that being said, she's a pretty good rapper. Right. Yeah. Um, she had a lot of guests on this album, including more recently, like I think P. Diddy's on this album. I think Lil Baby's on this album. And seeing as she raps as good or better than the featured guests on this album is her way of saying that she deserves a seat at the table. She deserves to be respected as a rapper at the same level, if not better, than these people who she has on the same album. <laughs> I think this is her, I don't want to say coming out party because she already came out, but this is her statement album. Yeah, no, I, I 100% agree. Um, I think from the sound of it, I probably enjoy this a little bit more than you did. That being said, you're 100% right. I mean, this was her basically like, I want to show you what I can do record. And coming off of having one of the biggest songs of the year with WAP, I mean, this is the time to do it, right? Strike while the iron is hot. So yeah, WAP of course has Cardi B in it. A lot of people have been pointing out and it makes sense that this is pretty similar to Cardi B's uh, debut record, uh, Invasion of Privacy, which came out a couple of years ago. Mm -hmm. It's having the same kind of reaction where people are like, wow, this girl's real talented. And kind of can wrap circles around the people who are even featuring on her songs and i think that yeah it just shows that she has a lot of built-in talent um right i think action... this is all built off of nikki Minaj's starship album so i'm glad you brought nikki up because i think that that's going to be an easy reference point because if you think back the last 20 years of rap music there's not a lot a whole lot of female rappers prominent up at, at this level uh, to compare new female rappers to. Right, I think that's your starting point. But that being said, though, when you think back at Nikki's tr career trajectory, she was never known as a technical rapper. Mm -hmm. If anything, she kind of pivoted her, her career to be more of a melodic rapper, a, like, like a Drake, where she was singing and rapping on songs. She went in a pop direction for a few records there, tried to course correct it in the last thing that she did, but still, she's never really proven herself as a technical rapper. She's got an ear for uh, pop, but not really an ear for that traditional kind of rap. Megan and Cardi, however, clearly have shown that that's their wheelhouse. And I think on this record, Megan proves that that's the kind of rapper she is. So I think what we're going to see is Nikki is not lo no longer going to be the comparison point anymore i think we're moved past that uh which you know sucks to be nikki i guess she i think she's she has to come to terms with the fact that she is no longer in the same echelon <laughs> as she used to be um but yeah i honestly think this is a great uh great uh debut um it's really strong there's a lot of sing uh, uh, like potential singles in here um I think it's really funny. So you mentioned the features. I think it's really funny. And I pointed this out to you via text when I was listening to it. But it's funny how many times she invites guest rappers on to only make fun of them. <laughs> like she has the baby on and then she just has like a couple of verses of making fun of how he is a baby. Right. And yeah, it's just great. It's great. Um, and I, I really got a kick of that. A lot of great, a lot of great punchlines in this thing. She definitely knows how to write. A really funny verse. Um, right, a, lo a lot of good wordsmithing going on here. Yeah, great wordplay. The one thing that I don't didn't really come out liking that much were the actual beats on these songs. They're fine. They're serviceable. Um, I think she references a lot of other classic hip hop songs more than she needs to. Uh, there's not a whole lot of actual like craft going on. The actual music here it's all her rapping the rapping is first the songs kind of come second right well you know the chicken and the egg do you write the song first or do you listen to the <laughs> melody first 
Yeah, and in, in rap as a tradition, I mean, it's usually a collaborative thing. And so maybe the collaborators just weren't up to their A game this time. Um, that being said, though, it's an impressive, it's an impressive show piece for Megan Thee Stallion. And that being said, wait for the DJ Khaled remix on one of these songs to <laughs> hit number happen. one. <laughs> It'll happen. But yeah, I had a good time with it, uh, but it is exactly that. It's just, hey, you want to hear Megan the Stallion rap really well? Here you go. Here's 13 tracks of it. Yep. Yeah. Now, will we see this at the end of the year list? Not mine. Not mine. Probably not a lot of people's, um, but... but... It's a good album. For what it is, it's a good yeah, album. For what it is, it's really impressive. She's proven herself, which is good. All right. And, All right. and that brings us to our final segment here, a video game. Video games. As we round the turn into upcoming new releases, right. we have Kronos, colon, Before the Ashes for the PS4, Xbox One, Switch, and PC. Mm-hmm. We also have Empire of Sin, for Ooh. the PS4, Xbox One, Switch, and PC. Mm-hmm. Then there's Twin Mirror for the PS4, Xbox One, and the PC. You know, didn't we have a new console come out? Yeah, you, you'd think there would be uh, more games for them, huh? <laughs> Maybe. But that's why we have Worms Rumble for the <laughs> PS4, PS5, hey, and PC. There's one. There's one, one for there. you PlayStation 5 owners. Uh, that being said, I believe all these PS4 games can run on a PS5, though. Yeah. Yes. Uh, so technically, they are PS5 games if you want them to be. Yeah, anything is a PS5 <laughs> game if you try hard enough. <laughs> anyway. Anyways, um, we're not done with award shows, as no, we previously not. said, because... The Golden Joystick Awards. Real quick, Um, before we read the story, are you familiar with what this is? I don't even know who puts this on. I think it's GameSpot. I don't think it is because I didn't see any GameSpot branding. I think GameSpot has a separate thing. I don't know what entity puts these on, and I don't think anybody cared, but all of a sudden this year everybody cares, and I'm not really sure why. It was Twitch streamed. I believe it was from GameSpot. I don't know. While you're looking at, uh, or I'll look it up. Uh, while, while you're looking you look, that up, see yes, who puts on the Golden the Joystick Awards, I'll tell you who the winners are. And probably one you would think wouldn't win, depending on which side of the fence you land on, because Naughty Dogs, The Last of Us Part Two, took home a record-breaking six trophies. And if you missed the show, don't fret, because we've got all the winners right here. Okay, well, real quick. I have information for you. They are British awards. They're held specifically for the UK. And apparently they're super old. They're an independent thing that's been going on since, get this, 1983. I was going to say 86, but okay. Not not too far off, actually. But yeah, they, you can actually look up a winner uh, for any year since then, which is kind of crazy. Um, Those so are there, like Tetris for the first three years? <laughs> <laughs> no. No, um, however, um, Manic Miner was the best arcade style game of the year in 1983. Game of the year was Jetpack because this is the UK and they freaking love everything that Rare ever made. So there you go. Ah, all right. Anyway, so yes. I guess they don't like just UK stuff anymore because outside of (laughs) The Last of Us Part Two winning six awards, other big winners include Hades, which came away with Best Indie and Critics' Choice Award as well as Fall Guys, which took the crown for Best Family Game and Best Multiplayer Game. With the showcase hosted this year by Laura Bailey and Travis Willingham, Travis Willingham, Willingham. fans also got to see the vulnerable actors, voice actors give the Best Performance Award to their Avengers co-star, Sandra Saad, who played Kamala Khan in Square Enix smash up superhero Marvel's Avengers. I mean, hey, cool. Good for her. But yeah, you kind of sent me a text message with these two winners, the uh, Last of Us 2 and Hades next to each other and saying, is this foreshadowing our argument that we will have? Because yeah, I mean, this is further proof 
which I think we mentioned this last week too, that it's kind of those two games are the big hitters this year. And we're going to see probably depending on the publication, one of those two winning a lot of game of the year awards. Right. I think you see a lot of critics may lead towards last of us part two, whereas any fan vote may go towards Hades. Interesting that you say that because because this is the reverse. I feel like I that's that. actually the reverse because yeah, I think you're going to see a lot of the fans be more traditional in this case and go with Last of Us, the big Naughty Dog blockbuster because AAA. AAA. Whereas you're going to see a lot of critics for like some of the smaller websites probably lean more towards Hades um, as those are the places that didn't quite like Last of Us when it came out. Right, and seeing as we have both played both of these games, yeah, actually, you all three, were, including Fall Guys. So I think we're getting to the point where now I may have, I don't know, how how many clears do you have on Hades so far? Uh, three. Okay, I am now played more Hades than you. Right. Uh, but you've, of course, played a lot more Last of Us than I have. Right. Um, but yeah, I, I've played through that three times, I think, now. I have six Hades clears now. Okay. Because I had uh, because I had a run last night where I got three new ones. Three in a row? I Not in a, two row. in a row. I got two in a row. I did a, another bow run and another spear run, two in a row. Then a sword run, which I failed. And then that uh, gun run that I sent you the results of. Yeah, I can't see the spear. Won. I can't see uh, the spear real quick. The spear is... I'm not liking the spear. I love the spear. Spear is my second favorite after the bow. So. Like, like I said, the shield and the gun and... Shield's pretty good. The bow I, are kind of mine. But I'm having the hardest time with the sword and the, the, the gloves, the gauntlets. The melee, I like having a distance. So the melee stuff, when there's not a whole lot of options for like projectile. Right. See, I'm more hard. up close in the melee combat right okay. up there. Yeah. But anyways, Hades is good. Let's continue with the yes. story. <laughs> anyways, Hades is good. Um, real quickly, because it's not on here, mm. but we did mention Square Enix Avengers. I just want to take a mention that it's been losing a lot of viewers or a lot of play. A lot of players, yeah. And they had pushed back the release of the Hawkeye expansion because of it. So that game is currently crashing and burning before our eyes we're watching a much slower and less dramatic version of what happened to anthem right i think is what's happening it's just that there's not going to be a player base by the time they want to release more stuff for it they wanted games as a service but they needed that multiplayer to hit with people yeah. and doing daily missions is isn't how it's gonna hit i will say one thing advantage it does have that anthem didn't have is that they had the luxury of kind of a second launch with the new versions for the new consoles. When they released the PS5 and Xbox Series versions of this game, I think maybe they're hoping that'll be another boost to get more people playing. So that's happening sometime next uh, sometime next year. Okay, but until that happens... Until that happens, who knows? Yeah. I mean, I, I'll, I plan to see it at the bargain bin this holiday season. Oh, yeah. Which is when I'll probably stick it and pick it up. And Steam sales. Watch Steam for sales. Yes. Oh, speaking of Steam sales, Jackbox Party Pack 7 on sale. Steam only, though. Ooh. For how much? Uh, 25 so $10 off. Not bad. Not bad. Hades is also on sale right now on Steam, if you're interested and you still haven't bought it. It's only 20 bucks. That's still worth the 25 it normally costs. <laughs> Dude, 30. I was actually thinking about this last night that, like, I only spent $10 on Hades because I had a coupon and it was on sale. Right. And I'm thinking like, actually with the amount of Hades I've played at this point and the, the amount I like it, I would have easily paid $60 for this game. I'm right. getting way more out of this than $10 warrants. So anyway. Anyways, a game you probably should be getting your money's worth out of because you paid for its expansion pass. <laughs> Pokemon. <laughs> Yes, they're um, in the news. Yeah, so the Pokemon company is teasing a new announcement that will take place tomorrow. Yes. During the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade. Yeah. On the day, a giant Pikachu inflatable balloon 
is expected to make an appearance, though the streets of Manhattan will uh, be joined by a troop of dancing Pikachu <laughs> on the ground. Through the streets of Manhattan. You said but, though. Though. Uh, but Nintendo and Pokemon fans alike should expect something else this year. That comes from a Pokemon company press release where it was said that Pokemon fans should look out for a big announcement of some sort during the big parade. The company said Pokemon fans will want to tune in to find out why they're making a special appearance this year. Hmm. So, a couple things about this. First, important to note, it's not in the story, but just a fun trivia fact for y'all. This year, the 2020 parade marks the 20th anniversary of Pokemon Balloon being in the Macy's Thanksgiving Parade. First one was in 2000. Uh, the second thing is, so yeah, what is this announcement? Well, who knows? Um, the internet seems to be assuming, because of, they always do, that this is a Gen 4 reboot, that this is your Diamond Pearl remakes. I'm thinking probably not, but hey, I'll be pleasantly surprised if it is. Um, my thought that I had earlier thinking about the story when I was writing, when I was doing this uh, news gather, was... They did just the other day say what the um, uh, localized title of the new Pokemon movie is. I believe it's Secret of the Jungle. Yeah. And so and there's a trailer out for it. Yeah. So is this just the release date? Is that what this is? Like, is this possibly that you'll have a trailer during the yeah. parade or that they made a deal with Netflix and they're going to say we'll premiere on Netflix on blah, 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 because they've done the last couple premieres on Netflix or available now on netflix so i don't think is, it's localized yet though yeah i don't i think that, yeah we'll see uh but yeah so this I is me telling you don't yeah, get your hopes up christmas day on netflix yeah in that commercial so you know i don't think you should get your hopes up um for diamond and pearl remakes um if they're going to announce those they're not going to do it be during the macy's thanksgiving day parade they're going to announce proper games during a pokemon centric nintendo direct they always have they always will Right. I think your other type of announcement could be something with Pokemon Go yeah. being a new event for the holiday season. I could see that, even though they're already talking about, I think, the holiday season Go event. So maybe not, but... Right, but it could be as simple as we're making you uh, have the option to put Santa hats yeah. on your Pokemon yeah. for the upcoming holiday season. So yeah, I'm just, regardless of what the announcement is, I'm really excited for somebody to explain what Pokemon is to Al Roker, because that's a time-honored tradition, or no, the opposite, right? Al Roker is usually reading the, the prompt about Pikachu to the other, <laughs> other hosts. Right. Always great. Always a highlight of my year when somebody has to explain what Pokemon is. Also for the Macy's <laughs> Thanksgiving Day Parade, uh, not your traditional telecast this year. No. It's going to be weird. Yeah. They have four different spots set up for the parade. So people in Manhattan don't kind of all conglomerate right. onto one area. Yeah. They'll be switching back and forth between different areas. But they're still having balloons. So also, yeah, they're still having the balloons. And from what I understand, the um, traditional um, Broadway performances will still also happen, but not there. They will cut away to a probably previously recorded segment and show that on the telecast. Right. And then uh, as following will be the traditional dog show. Of course. You can't um, not have the dog show. No, I love the dog show. Well, the dog show. If the dog show is what you watch while you're eating the like the snacks while you're waiting for the meal to be re ready, that's tradition. No, it's the halftime of the uh, football games. If you watch football, yeah. <laughs> As we mentioned, you watch football. <laughs> <laughs> Clearly, that's what I'm talking about. How excited I am for these games! All right, well, that's it. All right, yeah, that's it. That's it for this episode. That's all we you got. got anything? No, I didn't play anything beyond Hades. And I already talked about it, so I'm not playing anything beyond my usual games. So yeah, so we're, we're done good. here. All right, time for Thanksgiving. Is the turkey ready? <laughs> <laughs> so yes, thank you for joining us for this wonderful episode of the Media Boat Podcast. As 
as you just mentioned, tomorrow is Thanksgiving here in the US. Please enjoy responsibly, be safe, don't infect your family, uh, but eat lots of turkey, why not? Enjoy yourself, regardless of whether you're with family, at home by yourself or with friends, however you're uh, celebrating this year. Hope you have a safe and fun one. Make sure to we'll get some. Turkey. Turkey. Or get some. Tofurkey or whatever you want to eat. Ham, to holiday you. hams. Holiday ham. Be a ham. Be your own holiday ham. You be the holiday you ham you want to eat. It's true. Uh, but we'll be back next week for another episode of the Media Boat Podcast. If you want to catch us in video form or on YouTube, go to youtube.com, search Media Boat Podcast, and you'll find our page. Like, subscribe, click a bell to subscribe. It's all of that and more that you've heard from other YouTube hosts is true for us too. So help out by clicking that little bell and joining us. You can also listen to us in podcast form. That's audio only if you're into that kind of thing. On Apple Podcasts, Amazon Podcasts, iHeartRadio. That's our new one. Spotify, um, Google Play, any of those things, plus more. We're there. Uh, listen to us, download, uh, download us for your long car trip or whatever you have planned for the weekend. All sorts of things. Um, you can also catch us on social media. At Media Bookcast is our Twitter handle. We're back. We were down for a little bit, but we're back. You can always interact with us there. Send us a DM. I believe DMs are open. Yes. Um, no, you can email so. us if you have questions as well. Mediabookpodcast at gmail.com is that email address. And I think that's it for the plugs. Oh, mediabookpodcast.com is where we're posting new episodes of the show. If you would like to read a synopsis and watch the YouTube video embedded inside. So go there as well. Mediabookpodcast.com. Thank you for joining us this week. We'll be back next week for more. So stay tuned. We'll be back after being full of holiday spirit and joy. Yes. And we will enter December next time yes. we talk to you and start kind of winding down the year. The final month Ugh. of 2020. Join right. us next time. Okay, bye. Bye. <laughs>